Hey, folks, today we're sponsored by Slingbox. Watch your TV on your favorite mobile device, no matter how far away you are from home. Other products only stream to your local Wi-Fi network or only provide a small subset of channels. And if you watch live sports, you know that the league apps black out specific games, teams, or entire sports. Slingbox lets you watch all of your favorite shows, sports, and news live or on your DVR anywhere in the world with no monthly fees. Go to slingbox.com slash WTF and get $50 off, plus free shipping on a new slingbox. That's 50 bucks off and free shipping at slingbox.com slash WTF. Also, people, Emmy voters, you've got eight days before ballots are due on June 20th. And if you've been watching and enjoying my show, Marin on IFC, I hope you'll give some consideration to it when casting your ballots. Our friends at A&E would also appreciate it if you consider the second season of Bates Motel for the following categories. Outstanding Drama Series, Outstanding Lead Actor in a Drama Series for Freddie Highmore, and Outstanding Lead Actress in a Drama Series for Vera Farmiga. It's a great show, and if you haven't had a chance to catch any of it, you can check out Bates Motel on Netflix right now. It's definitely worth it. A&E genuinely appreciates your consideration this year. Okay, on with the show. All right, let's do this. How are you, what the fuckers, what the fuck buddies, what the fuck nicks, what the fucksters, what the fuckstables, what the fuckleberry fins? Welcome. This is uh, this is WTF. I am Mark Marin. So it's hot and sweaty in my garage. I've had a very aggravating day. I don't want to start with complaining. I'm not complaining. It's just some shit went down today, but I'll get to that perhaps. I do want to say today on the show, uh, Mr. Billy Wayne Davis, young comic uh, out of the southern region of the United States, uh, talked to him. In a bit, I just want to also update you on what's going on in my calendar. There seems to be some misunderstanding about some things. This Saturday, we'll be at the first annual 26th Annual Comedy Fest in Chicago. Uh, that is almost sold out from what I understand, but you can go to WTFPod.com to get tickets for any of these. On Tuesday, June 24th, Lawrence Arts Center, that's for some sort of film festival I'll be doing. June 25th, the Firebird in St. Louis, sold out. Sorry. Uh, there might be tickets available for walk-up. June 26th through the 28th, I'll be at the Comedy Attic in Bloomington. Now, I want to make it clear. I, I've told some of you my dates coming up in Austin and Dallas and Houston and Tampa, Charlotte, uh, Atlanta, Georgia. Uh, though I will be at the Comedy Zone in Charlotte August 14th through August 16th doing an hour stand-up. A lot of those dates are at amphitheaters. And some people are like, wow, you must be doing all right. Other people are like, an amphitheater in the middle of fucking August in Tampa? Are you out of your mind? I understand these sentiments. But what I want to tell you is that many of you who know me and know what I do uh, are, are fans already, and I appreciate that. But I'm doing the Oddball Fest. The lineup looks good. It's going to be Aziz and Atel and Louis, from what I understand, Sarah Silverman. It's going to be great. It's going to be like a reunion for some of us. There's some other comics on, obviously. So I'm doing some of those dates. It's not just me at the Mid-Florida Credit Union Amphitheater. But whatever, I'm on the Oddball Fest. Go to WTFPod.com, go to the calendar, I, I, and, and see the dates, okay? All right. So that's out of the way. I appreciate the vote of confidence when you're like, you can't fill an amphitheater. I know I can't. I can with Louie. I can with uh, Sarah and Dave and Aziz. Yeah, then I can. I'm doing short sets. So the point being that some of you who know me, you're not going to get the full Marin effect necessarily. You'll get 15 minutes from me, but then... You know, if people dig me, I'll come back to your area and do my own show. That's my thinking on it. You guys, Bob Mold fans, uh, he's, I'm going to have him on the show in a few weeks, but I just wanted to hip you to the fact that his new album, Beauty and Ruin, is out now, and he'll be going on tour this fall. You can check out all his stuff at bobmold.com. Uh, that was a good conversation. Oh, by the way, can I just mention clearly that Bobcat Goldthwait's new movie, the movie is called Willow Creek. It's a Bigfoot movie, and uh, it's getting amazing reviews. So go track that down where you can. I know it's playing in some theaters. I know it's uh, available to DVR in some places. But Bobby, you know, he had directed a few episodes of Marin, and uh, I want to help him out. I want to help him out with his new movie, Willow Creek, the Bigfoot movie, the Bigfoot movie. Why can't I fucking talk? God damn it. All right. It's been a long day. But go see Bob's movie if you want. I recommend it. This Thursday, I'm Marin on IFC. 
It's a good show, but apparently some of you saw it because a Canadian network screwed up and ran it out of sequence, but most of you haven't. It's based on uh, me and Caroline Ray play me and Caroline Ray, and we used to have sex occasionally, and now we're at the ages we're at, 50 or so, late 40s, whatever you want to frame it as, and we thought, well, let's give it another try. Dave Anthony gets involved. There's a cat involved, not in the sex, but yeah, so... It's a pretty fun episode, and the backstory about this is that I did date with Caroline Ray, or we did hang out a few times, but also Dave Anthony did as well, and that is the triangle that is being played fictionally on Marin tonight. Did I say this Thursday before? Tonight. So that's the backstory. There's a real backdrop to this. I just want you to know, and I don't think uh, I don't think Caroline would mind, but the backstory is at different points back when we were in our twenties. Both Dave and I, I'll, I'll be polite, dated Caroline Ray, and in uh, and in, uh, in and in the, this episode of Marin tonight, some of that happens again. Well, at least I date her. I don't want to tell you what happens. So enjoy that. So getting back to Deaf Black Cat, who I was beginning to grieve his loss. I told you on the last on show Monday, haven't seen him. Getting a little worried. It's been over a week. The day after I said that to you, the day after, Black Cat, Deaf Black Cat, hanging out on the rail on my on my uh, deck, just laying there, looking at me. I look out my bedroom window, there's Deaf Black Cat. I'm like, what's up? Nice to see you. And he was like, nice to see you too. And then apparently he said, I'm not really eating here anymore, and uh, I'm no longer into hanging out on your deck. But I wanted to check in because I knew you were you were panicking. Don't panic. I'm just hanging out at a better place where the food's better and uh, it's less aggravating. You you clearly, you, you have a frenetic energy that makes me uncomfortable. I have enough on my plate. I'm deaf. So I'm like, okay, well, thanks for checking in. I appreciate it, DBC. So he's all right. Am I all right? I don't know. Hey, folks, have you seen ads for Harry's around? Maybe you've seen an ad with a big H well, if you're still wondering what Harry's is, I can tell you because they're one of our sponsors. Harry's has only been around for less than a year, but they're already challenging the big boys like Schick and Gillette by offering a better experience and better value when it comes to shaving. When you go to harrys.com, you can get razors, high-quality blades, and shave creams at a fraction of the price that they cost in the store. One of the guys who started Harry's is Jeff Rader. He's also one of the guys who started Warby Parker, so you get the idea. There was a quote from Jeff in USA Today this week, and I think it's a good explanation of of what they're doing over there at Harry's. The process of shaving isn't the most comfortable thing, he says. We're not saying when you shave, disco music comes on and your life changes. We just want to, we just want to help guys take care of themselves. And his co-founder, Andy Katz Mayfield, summed it up with, uh, it's about better products, better pricing, and an overall better buying experience. So there you go. Go to harrys.com and use the promo code WTF5 to save $5 on your first purchase. Harry's, H-A-R-R-Y-S dot com promo code. WTF five, that's the number five. Billy Wayne Davis in a couple of minutes, but first I gotta I gotta walk you through my morning if I could. You know, what's your biggest fear? Tell me what your biggest fear is. Just tell me. I bet you identity theft is right up there. Right up there. What a scary fucking thing that is. So, needless to say, transition, segue, I get a call, an email from my mom. She says, I just got a call from a bank in Michigan. This woman, uh, Barb, called, said that uh, someone was trying to open a credit card account with your name, and they called me. She, My mother then says, sounds like fraud. I don't know what's going on. What's even more upsetting is how did they get my phone number? How did Barb at this credit union in Michigan get my mom's phone number? That was her big concern, not the fact that what the fuck is going on with my information, so Barb leaves a number. She calls me, and I didn't I didn't pick up because I, I was doing something. I call her back. Some guy with my name and my social security number is trying to get a credit card. She said it smelled fishy. wanted to check. She did a thorough check of who I was, clearly who my mother was, you know, uh, other activity on, on the social security card. She did her job and called me and said, this is fishy. We didn't We didn't process this. We didn't allow him to get an account, but you might want to do some follow-up on this. She gave me a bunch of stuff I needed to do. I needed to call TransUnion. I needed to call the uh, the other credit rating agencies. I needed to call the Social Security Administration, who put me in touch with the Federal Trade Commission, uh, where they gave me an affidavit and a, uh, 
a proof of uh, that I reported this fraud. And then uh, I had to get my credit report. I have to file a police report because some fucking criminal, some criminal asshole somewhere in Oakland, California, got hold of my social security number and my name. And I guess that's all it takes to get multiple lines of credit. So I called up TransUnion to put, told them to put alert, an alert on the account. I got my credit rating, uh, the full readout of it. And sure enough, there, there was a, a phony address on there which also Barb told me when she called the guy to do follow-up, the Mark Marin, who was trying to get a credit card. He hung up on her. So she knew something was fishy. Did her job. But then when I get my credit report, not only is the fake address on there with activity, but there are four banks, credit unions, where this guy's tried to open accounts and successfully opened one. God damn it, fuck this guy. This isn't funny, but I'm telling you, protect yourself against this shit. Get an alert. Pay the 10 bucks a month to get uh, your your uh, information watched. I had to call my bank and make sure everything was okay there. I had to call my other credit cards and make sure everything was okay there. Put extra security measures on everything. Uh, I was on the phone. And then I just called these four or five credit unions that were listed as having transactions with me around the same date, about a week or two ago, two weeks ago. I alerted them to uh, this uh, dubiousness, this fucking criminal activity in my name. They were grateful, but it slipped by. One account got through. The guy opened an account and uh, provided some sort of identification, a utility bill, uh, some sort of uh, ID. So I guess what's happening, it's all done online. How How do you not process this shit if you're a bank or someone who's lending money you will accept scans of IDs? Do you know how easy it is to falsify that shit? I alerted all these other cre- these credit unions. One of them was about to ship a credit card off to this dude. And if you're listening, you fuck. What the fuck? You asshole. Anyways, they were about to send this credit card out with a, with a huge line of credit based on my credit rating, which... Could still turn into shit. I don't know what this guy's up to. I've done everything I can. But it was about to go out tonight. The credit card was about to go out with a huge line of credit. And who the fuck knows what would happen? They were able to cancel it. What a nightmare. You know, and I don't know. I I, I don't know if it's over or not, but I did everything I could. But the point being, protect yourself. Get some sort of alert on your credit, on your social, you know, so you know if someone's, if there's behavior going on. I didn't, and this couldn't, it could have gotten out of hand if it wasn't for Barb, the Lake Michigan Credit Union, doing her job. I got to send that woman some chocolates, perhaps a bouquet of flowers, doing her job, doing background check, finding me, finding my mother, and doing the right thing. Completely grateful. What a nightmare. But you know, the one thing that, that I found disturbing about my own reaction to this was, if I were a bigger name, he wouldn't have been able to do this. That that was my feeling. It's like, would this happen to Chris Rock? Would it happen to to, to Louis C.K.? You know, I mean, maybe some people where he tries to use this bogus credit card, this criminal asshole posing as me, they'll be like, oh, Mark Maron, the comedian. I guess all he would have to say is, yeah, it's weird. We got the same name. But protect yourself, people. That happened to me this morning. I'm not happy about it. It ate up my whole day. Watch your data back, will you? Man, scary shit. He could have bought a house. Anyway, let's go now to me talking to my uh, my pal Billy Wayne Davis. I think I had to, uh, you know, throughout my life, uh, you know, it was the only way I kept myself intact was to be defensive. But, well, it's a, yeah, you know, I, I walk away. I learn, like, if I get into that moment where I raise my voice, I walk away because I can feel myself getting hot. And then once I get to a certain level of being hot, I can't. It's like that thing on stage when someone says something and you just turn. Yeah. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Yes. Yeah. And it, it's, I'm cold. I just go cold and I'm just saying. Cold and hot. Yes. You go cold, and then all of a sudden you are possessed yes. by this other thing. 
who the fuck yes, are you? Yes, and I'm just taking it, everything ever out on that person. And right. I know that person, so I know their buttons, their insecurities, and I'll say that. And so now I just walk away because I'm like, I don't mean to do that. But, but let's talk about the stage thing because, like, they're they're... I mean, I haven't done that in a while, but it's always right there. Yeah. Like, as soon as, like, you know, I'm in my shit, I'm open, I'm doing my work, you know, and then one little thing, and I'm like, what the fuck? Yes. <laughs> and then, like, you know, you sometimes, you know, I have lost it full on on an audience. Before. Yeah. Well, my girlfriend pointed out a month ago, she said, once you've stopped drinking, you can... She was like, when you were drinking, and you just had even a couple on stage, and then that happened... You were just full bore at that person, and he, she was like, "Now you have more fun with them, and you're not gonna go." And I was right, like, it's a conversation. Yeah, it's not. Yeah, it's Whereas not before, like. Before like, why would you interrupt what I'm doing? And I'm, I still feel that way, but now I know there's a more constructive way to. Sure, like you're like, what? Are you serious? <laughs> yes. Is there more? Can I continue? It's it's. It drives me like sometimes I can't sleep. I'll have a good set, and it's just like one person. It's like, what the fuck was up with that Why guy? did they come to the show? Right, right. And that's what you hold on to. Like, everything was good except for that. Yes. And, it's that and you sort chasing of, the dragon shit. Yeah, yeah, right. It was, it was so close to perfect. It was so close. It's never perfect. Billy Wayne. Yes. Three right. names. Yeah. Billy Wayne Davis. Yeah. Did, did people call you Billy Wayne when I you prefer, were a kid? No, everyone uh, called me B.W. or Boo. B.W. or Boo. Yeah. That's some southern shit. It's yeah. You you think B Billy Wayne's <laughs> as southern as you get, and then you're like, no, nah, I didn't even go by that. I went <laughs> B W is more southern. Yes, and, and then I went by that when I first started doing comedy. And B W Davis. Yes, and then a couple people pointed out that were ahead of me, like you should probably change that because when people see that, they think you're a black comic. And then that happened a couple of times. I got booked at these. Why nighters. would they think that? Because a lot of black comics have just initials. Oh, really? I didn't know that. Especially in the South, that Southern... The Chitlin Circuit? I, I didn't want to call it that, but that's what it is. is that, I thought they call it that. I think so. But I'm, I'm very... Un, with my accent, I'm very cautious about how I put things. Have you gotten into trouble? Not like a, on a grand scale, but definitely in situations, yeah. <laughs> like what? Just... I, I found when I moved to Seattle, like if I talked about race at all... I was handling people after the show. You were suspect. Yes. He's one of them. Yes, they're trying to figure me out. You can tell. And it was a lot of he me. He talks like one of them. Yes, it was a lot of me explaining the joke and yeah. what I was doing. Yeah. And then I was like, okay. And then and I noticed quick in Seattle, too, that there's not a lot of black people or people of color at all. It's just white people. So it's really easy to be progressive. Yeah, there is, but it's a neighborhood. Yeah, you know, there's a black neighborhood. Well, that's and that's cracked me up because every everyone from Seattle was like, "Oh, that's the ghetto." I'm like, yeah. "No, that's a neighborhood that black people live in. Exactly. That's not a ghetto." Yeah, what is up with that? It's so strange. And, but yet you're the racist. Yes, because it, it, of my accent. Yes. Right, you have a racist accent. Yes, but I was I was the suspect, and I was like, no, no, "You guys, I've grown up around black people <laughs> more than most people have." Yes. <laughs> yeah, that's like that. That always fascinates me. I was talking to um, Nate. Yeah, Bargetsy yesterday, you know, and it's just that there there is a language and a a a, a sort of understanding uh, in the South that is much deeper and much different. And I'm not saying the racist thing, but they they have lived together. Yes, you have lived together for years. It's more. It's not the language. It's more of the tone. Right. In the South. Right. But but even but but despite that and whatever evolving the South has done in certain pockets, which I think it has, there is a there, it's more integrated in some weird way yeah. than most cities. Yes. Like the place where the racism was invented in this country is always more integrated than than any city. Like cities are structurally segregated. Yes. It, well, it's like Nate's joke about melting pot in New York City. He's like, it's not really, it's a bunch of pots that want to live next to pots <laughs> like themselves. Yeah. Like it's, they're not melting. Yeah, I don't know. I, I just think that there's a, there's an integrity to, to, uh, to the discourse down there that doesn't exist everywhere else because everyone else is just, we have no real experience. Yeah. Uh, with, with cohabitation or, 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 or your ways, but we feel guilty. Yes. Yeah. Well, and, and I think in the South, there is that, and this sounds so strange to say, 
It's like there's a lot of people that don't have that guilt because it's like we grew up poor. We my yeah. family didn't own slaves. <laughs> yeah, we 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 were borderline slaves ourselves. Yes, like I'm Irish. Mm-hmm. I came from slaves kind uh-huh. of thing. Is like we were poor too. So well, we, that that really is what it is. It's a it's a class issue. Yeah, and you know you get like and you get angry poor people fighting each other, and then rich people are like, "Oh, look at that! Yes, look, there's the problem. It's a racial problem. No, it's a poverty problem that you don't want to address." Yeah, and everybody, you just let them fight it out. That's Memphis. <laughs> that is Memphis in a nutshell. <laughs> Memphis is crazy. Where'd you grow up? Uh, Crossville, Tennessee. It's between Knoxville and Nashville. It's a little. Mountain town, basically, it's on a plateau. And it, it, how many people in that town? I mean, what is that? I, I, I'm a little, I get a little fascinated with the South. I always, say, every time I'm there, I think it's amazing, and I'm just fascinated with it because I think there's more history there than almost anywhere yeah. in the country. And there's still more culture left, I think, in the South. Well, you mean like people who live real lives, the the, the indigenous people. That have been there for generations, and I mean the indigenous by your family. Yes. <laughs> no, I know what you're talking about. Uh, you know, still sort of function that way. Yeah. It, it's not been plowed under. It's not that suburb, right. Best Buy right. kind of. I mean, right. it's starting to happen, but yeah. it's not. There's still, like, people living that life and who they are and who where little, they came a, from. a little off the grid. The, yeah. The, new, and, the, and, new, the yeah. newly established grid of, like, you know, where, where, what are you, where are you shopping? Yeah, yeah like, well, we still go down to, to Joe's place. Yeah, like my grandparents drove to Rockwood, which is the town next to, <laughs> because one? they because the road when they were growing up was better to go to Rockwood than the, but they lived in our county for groceries, and for whatnot. groceries and every like the drugstore and everything. God, and it, back even back when people all Americans sort of had jobs and you kind of knew the guy that did the car, you knew the guy that knew did everybody, the, knew the, everyone that worked at the restaurant. You went to the same. I guess it was Dillard's or whatever it was. Sure, Dillard's at the mall. Yeah. With, with it was. It wasn't even like a in the mall. It was just like a downtown. This, yeah, just a three story building. That and the and in the ten store downtown area. Yes, and there's a Burger Barn. I still remember Burger Barn. Yes, uh, yeah. Rockwood is actually where Megan Fox was born. Mm. She grew up there till fifth grade, and I was like, yeah, and she got out of there. That's why she's famous, because someone that hot still living there would be pregnant. Nine times already, because the big redneck dude finished found her when yeah. she was fifteen, and and, uh, and and emotionally pummeled her, if not physically, <laughs> into submission. It's a it's a give and take with both. <laughs> so, well, what what was the town? What was the what was the the racket? What was your family doing? Uh, both my parents are teachers. Oh, really? And uh, my mom's an English teacher. My dad's a uh, history and PE teacher. But he's mostly a football coach, is what he does. Uh, I use teacher with air quotes. He's the teacher. So that's what they needed him for. I'm sure, yeah, they needed another teacher, but he's... They need, they need a coach, I mean. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, yeah so he, that's what he's done. And, like, my mom wants to retire, and my dad's like, yeah, I'm not. I'm going to coach football till they find me dead on the football field. He and loves it? He loves football, yeah. Like, he worked his way up. He was a... Head, high school football? Yeah, loves it. Had opportunities to go coach college and stuff. Really? Never cared about it. He likes coaching high school kids. Because he likes the the fact that they're teachable and that, you know, they're they're raw talent and that is not it's not I wouldn't say anyone from my hometown has raw talent. Or teachable? But, yeah, that's true. There may be a couple of them. He can structure them to work longer in yeah. the But I but I mean it must be somewhat exciting to to, to not have the pressure yeah, I guess there probably is pressure in regional high school football. In but. Tennessee, yeah, it's a big deal. Uh, he he was the head coach for a couple years. Of the high school team? Yeah. The head coach? He became the head coach and uh, was doing really well. They were, like, undefeated one year or, like, almost undefeated. And yeah. And year they were really good. Yeah. And then I called my mom one day, and she was like, oh, uh, by the way, your dad just quit coach being the head coach. Just said it nonchalant. I was like, whoa, 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 why? So I called him, and he was like, I didn't get to coach. All I'm doing is dealing with dumbass parents and politics. He was oh. like, and I got into this to coach. He was like, being the head coach is not coaching. It's just this. He's it's, like, I couldn't imagine it's being. It's a political position. Yeah, he the, he was like, I'm just dealing with assholes every day. I know people who, in academia of any kind, that once you're the, the department head, then you, you're just, uh, then you got to deal with all the other people's problems. Yeah, yeah, you're, he you're hated the, it. Yeah, you're the, the, the representative. Yeah. Team. Why isn't my kid uh, starting? 
Yeah, it was a right. lot of that. And, like, we donated a copier. He should be playing a little more. And he's like, well, he's got two left feet, sir. <laughs> and he's mostly autistic. We donated a copier. I mean, that's probably a real thing, I'm sure. <laughs> it's... There's a small town, and then they all have these delusions. I of fixed grandeur. your car. That's a lot. Yeah, like I gave you that paint to paint your hood. That's a real <laughs> thing. That's a real thing that happened. My dad still hasn't had the car painted, but he has the paint. Yeah, that's fucking hilarious. So then, so then he became what the assistant coach? Is that how that works? He just dropped down. He liked coaching running backs in the defense. So that's he likes coaching. He doesn't yeah. like dealing with. Asshole. Well, how'd he do with you? How was that? How was the uh, at home coaching? There was, there were, especially in high school, there was a couple times there was just screaming on the field. Did you go to the school? Mm hmm. And you played on his team? Yeah. Oh my God. It's like bad choice. There was only one school. But then you probably didn't have a choice but to play either. Well, that's the thing. I didn't care for football until I, because I wasn't, I I was a late bloomer. So I just played because my dad loved it. I love baseball. You got brothers and sisters? I have two younger sisters. Who are better natural athletes than me, which is very frustrating. But they, but they can't play football, right? No, no. I mean, I'm not saying that in a sexist way. Is it available to them to play? I mean, a... they could have tried, but I don't think they had any desire. What were they What were they doing? My sister's an amazing golfer. Golf. And my dad loves that, so that worked out for them. So he got one at least. And then my <laughs> other sister, uh, she played basketball, I guess, and then soccer. She hated soccer. And you're the oldest. Yeah. You're the boy. Yeah. Pressure's on. There was a yeah, there was a lot of well. That's growing up. I realized I was like, what the hell? Like, why do I have to be perfect? But then, because my mom was really hard on me, and then she had more understanding about the girls, and I was like, they're fucking assholes. Yeah. So it was just a weird dynamic. It was just me and my dad, and then my grandmother lived beside us in a house. Yeah, in another house beside us. Yeah. Whose mother? Uh, my mom's mom. Uh huh. And then my uh, dad's parents lived about two miles down the road. On a farm, they did. Yeah, so I would, uh, I would go to the farm a lot. I gotta go. Was yeah, that, was that where you learned? But no, what? When you got angry, or you need to run off, or you about? To well, yeah, get... I was either in a gym or just by myself somewhere because there's because women are manipulative from uh -huh. the start, uh -huh. and then you get two, and yeah. then they know all your who your sisters. Yeah, just constant fucking picking at me. Like like what? It's like a relationship. It's like it's a relationship that has no benefits. None. No, no, no fun benefits. <laughs> no, no. Uh, just they can help you pick a, the right girl or something. Uh huh. Uh, but yeah, it's like a relationship where they'll just pick at you very calmly until you explode, and then they're they're just like, "Wow, why are you acting crazy?" And you're like, "You just did that for like a day and a half." Uh. So it was a lot of setup, or they'd hit. Once they learned that they can hit me, and I couldn't hit them back. That was really. That was a nightmare year. Um, what? So uh, I'm, I see. I'm still like. they part of my brain just walks into this thing. So they pick and they pick and they pick until you pop, and they're like, "Wait, what?" Yeah. Wait. Which is, as I got older, I realized it's pretty funny from their point of view just to pick at someone well, until they I've lose their. Yeah, and I have too. <laughs> Dudes in my high school that used to fuck with all the time. But that's how comedian starts. Yes, it is. It's like, oh, I can. I know his tick. Where, where are my limits here? I mean, me. And it's probably made me more difficult in relationships because I I do see what women are doing more than I think most do. All right, look, I don't I don't want to get into generalizations, but I mean, the, I guess the best men just suck it up. That's my dad. <laughs> He's an amazing man. He's an amazing man. And as I get older, I see some of the stuff he puts up with. I'm like, that is amazing. That he just. So you're impressed by it as opposed to, like, you're going to take that shit? I mean, there was probably a period in, like, when my marriage was, when I realized it was unraveling and I needed to get out. Yeah. So I was about 26, 20, I would say 27, 28. Yeah. That I would look at my dad and be like, why the fuck are you taking that bullshit? Yeah. But then, like, the grander aspect is... Well, he's it, still married. Yes, they're still married. <laughs> yeah. They've, they're very happy. Mm -hmm. You know, my mom's a little, uh, she's a strong woman. Let's mm -hmm. put it that way. Um, <laughs> a very opinionated, strong woman. It's scary as fuck. What um, does that mean? I, well, my grandpa, uh, her dad died when she was 14. Yeah. She had two younger siblings, so she helped raise them. Right. And then had me when I was 21 because all she wanted was a family. When she was 21. Yeah. Yeah. Planned and everything, which is. And they were married? Yeah. They've been married like less than a year or something like that. Uh huh. 
I think they were married before she got pregnant. Uh huh. I think I don't know. I've never is, done uh, the math. Is that is that a is that common in the South? I think so. <laughs> I think I think it didn't. Uh, I'm sorry. See that was when those, I got married. One of those it, generalizations. It's very common. Yeah. Especially a small town. Well, no, like, but I mean like that. No, what's, is it common that people are actually married when they get pregnant? That's I don't a, think now. No. <laughs> yeah. I think then, yeah. Oh, you did it. You know, there, was a, there was a rule book. Well, they grew up down the street from each other kind of thing. My that's, mom's a year older. That's sort of sweet, right? It's amazingly sweet and has ruined me, I think, in society today. like Because I know it works. I've seen yeah. it work. And most people don't think it works. Yeah. So I have this almost expectation of like, no, this can work. I think I stayed in my first marriage a lot longer than I should have yeah. because I wanted it to work. And so your mom's tough. Yeah. And she doesn't take any shit. Well, that yeah, she's a teetotaler, too. Uh, oh, she's sober. It's completely. I mean, I think her. Dry or sober? I, th- yeah, like- I think, uh, no, well, her and my dad have like drinks from time to time. When they want to go have fun, uh-huh. but nothing. I mean, it's only with my dad. I've only seen my mom. She's only drank with me like twice. She's fun as hell when she drinks. Yeah, I could see why she shouldn't drink. Uh. She definitely got the gene. <laughs> uh. Would you, she get uh, uh, angry? She uh, get a well. You, you uh, it's like oh, you fun. are holding back. Yeah. Holy shit! Yeah, yeah, kind of thing. Yeah. You're like, that's funny. I'm glad it's not at me. Yeah, but so how do you end up so fucked up? I don't know. Like, I have, like, great parents, a great support system. Um, I wanted to play baseball. That was my whole... That's what did it? That was my... You got, you got bullied into football by your dad. Well, no, and I played college baseball. You so, did? So, yeah, and my dad knew that football was, like, something I just did. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then I got good at it, so it was fun. Billy Wayne Davis, that's a that's a baseball player's name. Yeah. Yeah, that's, a lot of scouts <laughs> like my name more than my ability. That's very true. Uh, so you went. So you did all right in high school because you had to. Mostly, yeah. And then you went to college where? I played junior college baseball for two years. Yeah. Volunteer State. Uh, we're the number one team in junior college, which I like to say to quote my friend Dan Whitehurst is like having the biggest dick in third grade. <laughs> it's pretty cool, but it doesn't mean anything. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and then like I played with guys that went and played professionally. And we were really good, and that's when I learned. Oh, I I can't, can't make it. I I don't have. You don't the, have the skill. I had I could I had enough talent, yeah. but I didn't have the the drive those guys did. My like, brother had was up against that in tennis, where he just realized like you know he doesn't he, he has to work twice as hard. Yeah, as guys who naturally have it, and you have to make a decision if you don't if you're not natural, are you going to make you know is it worth it to make the cut? What's it going to take? That's it. Yeah. And, and these guys, like, I, I also realized that I'd always switch sports. Yeah. And these guys play baseball all year. What was your position? I was a catcher. Which really? Which rough on your body. But I'd get bored playing any other position. Yeah, because you're just standing out there. It's mostly fucking standing there. Right. And the catcher, you gotta, you got to be on top I mean, of it. Yeah, yeah. They're literally throwing the ball to you every time. <laughs> uh, I like that part of it. I like yeah. the aggression part of it. Uh but yeah, the, these guys, their desire was much more than mine. I was like, I was already in community. I had a radio show at the community college, which I was having way more fun than yeah. going to hitting a fucking ball. What kind of radio show? It was just a fucking uh, morning. It was a morning show. Oh, really? Uh, 88.5. The college and, station. Yeah. You're doing a morning show. Dri- yeah. Drive time? I guess. Yeah. It was a <laughs> lot of, I would play stuff like from Goose Creek Symphony and the band and because I knew the guy that ran the station wasn't listening. Right. It was like four, five in the morning. Right. So I would just play music I liked. Yeah. And uh, like Sun Vault and Wilco yeah. and yeah. stuff like that. Yeah. yeah. And so I started getting like regular listeners, but they would be truckers that right. had this route. Right. That only they, that loved what I played because yeah. it was like Bob Seger and stuff right. like that. Right. So they were like, this guy. And then I'd just say dumb shit. So that was who that was my listenership, the baseball team and, and truckers that had a certain route in town. Yeah, not not too far out. Yeah, of the they, yeah, line. they weren't long haul haul yeah, guys. Yeah, yeah. They were yeah, yeah they, they were they, driving the the Mayfield Dairy Truckers yeah. like that. Yeah, because <laughs> they were up. Yeah, they were just and they just found you and, and were you being funny? Did you have a guy with you or what? It was just me and I would just I got in trouble because I was supposed to read the news and I would make fun of the news because I listened to Howard Stern. And I was like, that's what he does. Mm-hmm. 
I mean, I, I ended up getting a B in the class because I wouldn't stop making fun of the news. What, they wanted you just to be a news reader, yeah, when they, necessary. It was. I know what they were. They were teaching me how to do all the certain parts. To be a broadcaster. Yeah, yeah. And I was like, I'm not gonna. Yeah. I'm not gonna be a broadcaster. <laughs> but, I'm not losing this accent anytime. I just took. That phonetics class. <laughs> it's not going away. I got a D. <laughs> what a, so w- when did the comedy start? Um, well, I went to Western Kentucky for a couple years. And College? Then, or no, just... Uh, yeah, yeah. Western Kentucky University in Bowling Green. It was actually cheaper because I lived on a border state when I went to junior college. It was cheaper for me to go to in-state in Kentucky than it was See, 40 minutes from my house to go to the University of Tennessee. I have no sense of uh, of, of place uh, in, in most parts of the country, but I mean, when you go to Kentucky from Tennessee, are you like, "Nah, fuck, I'm in Kentucky now"? Yeah. <laughs> what 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 did what distinguishes the two from each other? There's a uh, Kentucky has like an attitude. Oh, really? It's kind of like well, I think there's more old money there. Uh huh. And then they one of the funniest things I ever saw was I was in Louisville, Kentucky. And uh, this dude was on the square holding the rebel flag saying, the, we will rise again, we will rise again. And I just rolled down, I pulled up and rolled down the window. And I was like, dude, you guys fought for the north. Yeah. <laughs> you need yeah. to go south a little ways. Yeah. And he just looked very confused. And I was like, yeah, you, you didn't fight for the Confederacy. And he just drove yeah. on. And my buddy's like, why did you do that? And I was like, I just wanted to mess his day up. I bet you did. You can just reevaluate his whole life. So I don't think he realized that, yeah, I think that's, there's a lot of old money, all that whiskey, it's just shady. Have you seen Justified? It's a very accurate show. Oh, really? Yeah. I, I, don't, I haven't watched it. Yeah, and I noticed basketball is a big deal there, like in Tennessee football is a big deal. I just think there's something. But what about that sort of, that, that, that southern style of, of, of kind of uh, ignorance I mean, how much do you come up against that? I mean, I mean, obviously it wasn't in your family. I don't, I wouldn't, I, I don't know if your, your family is progressive necessarily, but they were teachers. Yeah, I would definitely say, even to this day, they were just here. They can't stop playing devil's advocate. Uh huh. So, your folks? Yeah. Uh huh. So even stuff, like my dad loves listening to, uh, uh, right wing radio. Yeah. And it drives, and, he doesn't believe any. He's like, I just like listening to the enemy, yeah. seeing what they're thinking. I was like, and I'll just sit there. I'm like, we've got to turn this off. Yeah. Like, he, he enjoys the uh, the hate buzz. Yeah, and he's like, I just like knowing what they think. And yeah. I was like, yeah, but it's pretty simple. He's like, yeah, but you got to know how they're doing it and stuff. And I was like. When, when they come at you. Yeah, he's just a football. I mean, he was yeah. probably a general in his other life uh-huh. somewhere because uh-huh. that's how he thinks. He's a big Civil Strategy. War buff. Yeah. Is he a Civil War buff? Huge. It's it's annoying almost. And he plans on, he's like, when I retire, I'm going to go do the the reenactments. He's That's what he's going to do for his retirement job? Not as a job. I think just go do it. Just, he, who's he want to play? I, he, I haven't asked which side he wants to be on. I don't want to know. <laughs> As a Civil War buff, does that mean he dragged you to Vicksburg? And I've been to Vicksburg. I've been to Chickamauga. I've been all over. Yeah, that was definitely a detour on a lot of our vacations. We've got to go see the battlefield. Yeah, which there's something strangely peaceful about all of them, too. Well, I mean, I, I think it's an interesting. It, the, the thing that always interested me was that you know there were these divisions in families and communities that you know they would fight for a few hours and then you know when uh, when the general called time, they'd go over and eat with each other. Yeah, I, that to me is just insane. It was the bloodiest fucking war in the world. I mean, it, it, when you look at the numbers of people that died in that war, it's insane. It's scary. Yeah. yeah. Hundreds of thousands. I well, think. and I think that's why the SEC is so good at football and such a big. Because that is still ingrained in that kind of... There's regional conflict. Almost manners involved in uh-huh. the conflict, too. Like when they poisoned somebody's trees, like an Alabama fan poisoned some famous trees in Auburn. Like even Alabama fans were upset, like, no, no, we don't do that. <laughs> oh, it's, right, right. It's kind of like... They're not with us. Yeah, we'll punch them in a bar, but we're yeah, not going to... Yeah, that kill trees. That's yeah. just come on. Yeah, that's uh, uh that's uh, not fair play. Have some coof. Yeah, yeah. And then like, well, you're right. pissing while you're talking to me. Right, yeah, right. But I wouldn't, I wouldn't hurt somebody's tree. So, uh, so you you grew up sensing that 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 the uh, that there is still a, a competitive element between 
the Union and the Confederacy? Oh, yeah. <laughs> well, it's just like it's – there's a great Mark Twain quote I, I recently read about travel uh-huh. ruins all – sense of you know bigotry and all Uh that and and it really does like you just learn like oh no most people are awful yeah that's what i learned i really i I don't want to i i always want to go the other way i i I always want to believe that most people yeah there's an okay dude in there oh yeah definitely okay yeah that's why like i can sit in a bar in tennessee and just hear the most awful stuff because i'm like that dude would help anybody right he's just an you sort of have to make weird kind of exceptions. Sort of like, yeah, yeah, he's a little like that, but yeah, but he's all right. Yeah. yeah. Well, it's we do that with comics all I, the time. I know. There's tons yeah. of comics that, like, if you met just in another walk of life, you'd be like, that is an awful, terrible person. But you're like, he's one of my best friends. He's <laughs> fucking great. I know he's going to touch you in a weird way, but you just got to ignore that. He doesn't. <laughs> the spectrum thing. I guess you learn how to tolerate things, and as long as it's, you know, not... Uh, Illegal, yeah, or, or, or yeah, someone's hurt. Out. Yeah, someone's hurt badly. Yeah, yeah, I, I guess that's true. I think that's true about comics is that we're all kind of, you know, uh, broken toys of one kind or another, and you kind of like, yeah, he's a little off, but yeah. And I'm drawn to the people that are kind of the most broken, right? And I, I don't know that we necessarily get too close. You know, I, I think no. that there's this weird openness to all of it where it's, you know, there's still a, an understanding. You know, I don't. I, I and there's a lot of like we can be open, yeah. but if you if I get open about you, yeah, you're like, hey, hey no, you can't. Yeah, and that was like, between us. And yeah, that's why we're not having that conversation. Again. Yeah, like no, I can say that I'm a shitty person. You can't <laughs> say that. But okay, so you're in Kentucky. Uh, yeah. Um, I uh, joined a fraternity, which I really bought into. The they really sold me hard on the beer and pussy thing. Yeah. And I was like, this is exactly what I want. Cause this is what I, I need. I can see the future in this. Yes. Like, yeah. for two years, I was just a fucking meathead yeah. playing sports mm-hmm. in a small town. So I was like, this. Yeah. And then I got into it, and I was like, oh, this is awful. Um, it didn't hurt that the guy that got me in the fraternity was an actor who, he's been on Mad Men and all this stuff. Like, Oh, yeah, he's out here? Yeah, his name's Matt Long. He's a really good actor. Uh-huh. Uh, and I liked him, so he kind of got me, and then... He just disappeared after that. What do you mean? Uh, he got a play, and then he was gone Yeah, that next semester. So he was like, and I was just with these dudes from Kentucky that had money. Drinking. Drinking. And yeah. then they just had a different outlook than I did. So It's interesting, though, when you when you are from a certain class of people, and then you're, you, know, you, you realize, like, oh, these people don't give a fuck. They're, nothing's ever going to go wrong. I, I was in a weird denial that people were different. That class was that different. That it didn't exist. Yeah, yeah. I didn't. I don't, I don't think I wanted wanted it to. Yeah, yeah. You want to be like we're all the same. Yeah. yeah until really, when it came down to it, no, nah, you're not really. No, we're yeah, not. Yeah, I'm gonna be okay forever. I don't know what's gonna happen to you. Yeah, yeah. It was. Yeah. There's a very <laughs> like yes. Yeah, Just, yeah. That that and that opened my eyes to some stuff. And then these guys were already set. Yeah. Too. They right. already knew what their life was and all this stuff. And I was still trying to figure stuff out and just drinking were you the were you the crazier of the bunch oh definitely i uh because usually the guy that that's sort of the 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 guy from the outside it's like they all like to watch him yes they're very much give billy booze yeah right and he'll make the party happen uh until i would go too far or call him out on some bullshit Uh uh-huh and then i was yeah fights were there fist fights some most of most of the guys were pussies though are you a fighter though not really have you have I? Yeah. 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 I mean, I was an athlete too, so like I was always kind of good at it cuz I was an athlete and I but I never understood like in high school dudes wanted to fight me cuz I would date their ex-girlfriend or something and be like, "Why don't we just go play basketball? It's the same. We'll just prove who's more athletic." Say stuff like that to them and then you could just see it on their face. Well, what? <laughs> but we're supposed to yeah, we'll just hit each other. And I'm like, "Yeah. <laughs> Why?" <laughs> I don't, that proves nothing. It just proves that I'm better at hitting. But then I, my parents always told me you never start a fight, but you never walk away from one either. They taught you that. Yeah. So, yeah, that's why I was in a couple fights. And a couple of times I wasn't in fights, I just got punched because I deserved it. Oh, yeah? Just, yeah. I, I got a lot of fuck you in me, and then, 
you add booze in that, I'm just going to say stuff that I've already perceived that you've done. Yeah. And sometimes they hadn't done that. Like what? Just walking up to a drunk guy. Yeah. Bigger guy. Yeah. Talking to some girl. Yeah. Showing off for my friends, and yeah. I'll say something to his girl. Yeah. Tom and Bowling Green, the dude just turned around and popped me. He didn't lay me out, but I just... <laughs> Went, I got the point real quick. Was like, ah, uh, yeah. And I smiled at him. I was like, I'm sorry. He's like, all right, we're cool. <laughs> that was a that's a cool thing about the South and fighting though. It's like after it's over, like we're buddies again. Yeah, yeah we're yeah. probably closer friends now. So there was a moment where you're like, yeah, I, kind of, I had that coming. Yeah, like, like when I, it it was like that slow motion. Like, oh, he's gonna, yep, <laughs> take it. Hey, yeah, there's no, yeah, you can't duck at that yeah, point. Cause yeah. I just probably said something very dirty to the girl he was talking just to. Just because you want to start shit. Yeah, yeah. All right, so all right, so you're in this fraternity house and you drink him, and you're the mascot. You're the 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 drunk mascot. There was another guy we were competing. Oh yeah. Yeah, there was a yeah. He was very funny too. Uh huh. Uh, you put us together. It was a good time. But when did you decide to to do comedy? What inspired that business? Um. I was taking all these communications classes. I was watching a ton of, I've always been a fan of stand up. My parents were always a fan of sitcoms and, you uh -huh. know, reading. Yeah. And yeah, yeah. my mom always preached timing. She liked people with good timing. Yeah. Um, so I, I had that background in it. My dad always bragged about watching the first SNL. He had Richard Pryor albums and stuff. Oh, yeah. That's good. Cheech and Chong. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Cheech and Chong. Um, and then I was, all my speeches were funny. Yeah. And I liked being funny. And then this one you girl. You took a speech writing class or a debate uh, thing or what? Uh, speech writing, speech analysis, uh -huh. all the advanced public speaking. I did all that. I, oh, okay. I could have a major in communications right now, but I did a split business major because that's what my. But you focused on speech and then what you'd have to write speeches and read them for the class. Yeah, we or... studied Clinton. Oh, really? We studied him redefining the word he is. Uh huh. And then just a lot of his techniques. He's fascinating. Like, what are some techniques of speech writing? Um,. Well, not really speech right because uh, the the best technique is to write for their strengths. Okay. When with Clinton, yeah, he's just so charismatic. Yeah. That a lot of it was like a shale. I, I imagine it looked like a Reno nine one one script. Yeah. Where it's like okay, this is the main point. Oh right, right, right. Like improvising. Uh, Billy. But what was the idea when you took those classes? I know a lot of people just do communications because they don't know what else they're going to fucking do. That was my, basically, I knew I was good at speaking in front of people from high school and stuff. That, why? Why did you, you speak in front of people in high I school? I was uh, in student council and then... Uh, you did that shit? Yeah. Well, your dad tell you to do that? No, uh, you got an extra credit uh -huh. and then uh, we got these t-shirts that said student council and had staff on the back uh -huh. and that was like a free pass to do whatever the fuck you wanted like teachers did not oh really so yeah like you're, it, you're like future leaders of america these guys and it was like a cool thing in our school it wasn't like the nerdy it was like a right the the cool seniors and juniors when so I was you were a, a jock and a student council guy yeah i was like a li liaison that's why this nerd thing irritates me because mm -hmm. they're getting too powerful yeah and they're getting way too cocky yeah because I was like a liaison between the nerds and the jocks. Because uh -huh. I took, you know, I had interest in English and history and uh -huh. reading and all yeah. that because my mom. And then yeah. I w lived in this jock world because yeah. I was an athlete. Right. So I was never comfortable in either. So I was going back and forth. And you were the funny guy. So, like, I, I know what that's like. You, you could speak to both. You you, you were yeah. intermediary. You, you weren't locked in to being a dick. Yeah, I couldn't. Weren't yeah. locked in to being, you know, uh, socially awkward. But the nerds I found were bigger dicks. Well, but that, but back then, I mean, I don't know how old you. Are. How old are you? Thirty-three. Well, you know, I, I mean, there was a time where you know, nerds in 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 high school when I was younger, they 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 could only hang around themselves, and they were socially you know, awkward, and they, you know, a lot of them liked to play chess and D and D, yeah. and they were really good at math, and they just didn't. They were like a different from a different culture. Yeah. Like, I didn't have anything against them, but it, it, they always impressed me in a certain way, but they were not socially easy. No, they weren't. No, you're right. <laughs> yes. And they, I think they brought a lot on them that they couldn't. Like, my, I have a cousin, he's 12, he has Asperger's. Uh huh. And I think he's hilarious, but he's also, he has that weird where he's a dick. Yeah. That right. doesn't realize he's a dick. Right. And I see that in, like, friends I had in high school that were like, oh, they probably had. They didn't realize they were being a dick, and then they get this anger that everyone was a dick back to them. Right. 
Rick, but you're being an asshole first. Yeah, they don't they don't necessarily know because their brains are preoccupied. Oh well, yeah, why, why would I have social grace when this I, I put this in and this in yeah, and, I've, and I've, get this? Right, right. I've got yeah. I'm working on a problem. Yeah, <laughs> that's like that's what I want to tell all the nerds now. Like you guys need to ease up. <laughs> well, they're they're the dominant uh, cultural uh, defining thing now. Yeah. And now there's a lot of people that aspire to that somehow. But, I mean, and there's a lot of people that just dress the part. Yeah. But, I mean, I've had conversations with people about what true nerdism is, and it's really an almost, um, uh, it's an an obsessive interest uh, in something. And and, uh, it defines who you are. Well, I think that's why I've related to nerds, too. But you've got the other thing. You've got the weird kind of, you know, the thing that makes comics different is that uh, before everything else, there is charm. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and, uh, like, you know, I think I could probably resolve this just by being me. Yes. <laughs> yes. Let me, I got this. Yeah, yeah. I got this. Let me talk to him. Give me, if I'm not back in two minutes, you should come get me, though. <laughs> yeah, it's just this, this other thing is that we don't want to do that other work. No. We're going to be okay at shit. Yeah. But, but, you know, we'll get by because, you know, we'll do it good enough to get in, and then it's just sort of like we're hanging out. That's definitely why having a manager now helps me tremendously because it is like that was most of my career. It's like I got it. Yeah, It'll, yeah, yeah. I'll yeah. just call them. It'll yeah, be yeah. Fine. Oh, they they were mad at me. Yeah, right. Oh, yeah. they were. Why? Yeah. Oh, because I didn't do the thing I told them I would do. Right. No, yeah. you need to. Yeah, yeah. And also the the you you should just do what you do and let the managers and the club owners do what they do. All right. So here you are. You're the liaison, and then, but, but, okay, so you're in Kentucky, and you, you, you got I, your chops doing the speech thing, so you're watching yeah. comedy. What, what? So a lot of me entertaining at parties, and um, this girl I was dating at the time said, you need to go do an open mic. Because I was dep- she noticed that I was depressed. I didn't realize I was depressed. There were days that I wouldn't just, I just drink and then not get out of bed. Is and that then, uh, depression or alcoholism? It was depression, because I wasn't, I wouldn't, I was never an everyday drinker. Right. I was ever, ever, never. I mean, I would. I probably went on a couple uh-huh. binges where yeah. it'd be like five or six days of just like let's do this. Yeah, but that was a lot of on the road too. Sure. So I was You're supposed to. I was still doing stuff. Like yeah. then, I would just lay there right. for two days in between drinking. And she thought that somehow or another, an open mic would resolve. She goes, "You need." To- you need to see if you can do this. How you, oh, you'd been talking about it. Yeah. So you were obsessed with it, and you didn't have the balls. Yeah. Or just, yeah, or even the thought process to be like, oh, I, sh- I could pursue it. You know, I didn't know how. I thought, I'll move to Chicago and do Second City. Yeah. And stand-up was never, I never thought about that. Yeah. And then she, and I went and called Zanies and had a month, wrote. In Nashville. Yeah. Wrote yeah. five minutes, and uh, we broke up. In that month, which so there's a few more minutes. <laughs> yeah, well, yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. I got hasn't got that material now. Yeah, I probably hung on to that for four or five years. Her breaking up with me in that time frame. Well, oh, the oh, really? In, yeah. in terms of resenting her. Yeah, and but then eventually realized like, no, she. That's what she was. That was what we were supposed to do. It's you like, got to start thinking about life like that. Yeah. That, I mean, that's one of these weird keys to things. You, 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 there's no time for regret or spite huh. over something that didn't go right. Eventually, you got to be like, well, I did get this out of it. Yeah, and I've learned to ask certain questions about people. Yeah, but also like, like she, she told me she was bipolar six months in a relationship. Yeah. That's something you should lead with. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Was, well, I don't know if you should lead with it, but certainly within the first I week was, or yeah, two. Yeah, like if, if after two weeks, you're like, this may continue, by the way. I may have massive mood swings. Yeah. But also, she she uh, got you to do comedy for yeah. the first time. And I remember doing it and doing well, because the guy on before me was awful. Mm-hmm. And I was like, okay. And I remember throwing up before. Really? And I'd seen that growing up. People do that before sports and stuff. I always thought it was, I was like, that's bullshit. What are they? They're so dramatic. Yeah. And I was so nervous, I threw up. And then that made me more nervous that you could get that nervous, and I was getting that nervous. Wow. And so, but as soon as I stepped on stage, I was fine. Yeah. That went away. And I did well. And then a cat said, hey, there's this open mic on Tuesdays. We do every week. You don't have to bring people like Zanies and all that stuff. So you made an impression on the micer community. Yeah, it was a guy named Landon Lyon. 
But that's like, but that's the biggest deal. And like when a lot of young comics are like, why can't I, why can't I, why can't I? Because you've got to impress the other comics. Yeah. We're out of the gate. Yeah. You got to show them something different or at least within a month or two. The other guys who have got their shit little tight community and they know the things, they've got to go like, yeah, we'll let him in. Yeah. Like, that guy's all right. Yeah. Yeah. And I wouldn't have, if that dude wouldn't have told me, I probably wouldn't have seeked out. I would have probably just kept that monthly. Right. Right. Rainy's thing, but he was like, oh, there's this Tuesday This guy's thing. cool. See where the charm paid off? Yeah, it was. It really was. Yeah, you're right. And then I remember getting off stage and going like, oh, this is what I'm going to do. <laughs> And then, like, maybe three months later, I was <laughs> telling my parents, out? telling my parents, they actually asked me, they're like, so do you want to drop out? And I was like, how did you, like, you're just, you're yeah. miserable. Yeah. And all you talk about is this. Yeah. And I was like, I have a good GPA. I can go back. So I told him in seven years, if I'm not where I'm supposed to be. Seven. Wow. You're, you're I was like, 21. All right. I knew enough about it at that point to be like, it's going to take this long to at So least. you were pretty obsessed with it. Yeah. And you told your parents you were doing it. And, yeah. And they were probably concerned at first. And, I don't think they were. No, that's good. Um, I had a decent little job. Yeah. What Doing what? At the UPS store. Uh-huh. It's very interesting. Because yeah. there's just people coming in and out. You get to see what they get. It yeah. was fucking great. And it I was? could do it stoned. It was yeah. great. Yeah. Uh, uh, <laughs> one day I showed up drunk. Yeah. They what, didn't care. What do you mean you could see what they get? You see what people are buying and shipping oh yeah there's like private mailboxes there like, how, like, how do i ship this okay. well yeah well i learned how to pack stuff and then just like just you could tell a lot about people's personalities that's a stuff. practical skill knowing how to pack things it is <laughs> it's people don't have it no i know yeah. and it's weird like when i'm like no you need to do this and this and people are like how the hell i'm yeah. like it's just something i did yeah picked I, up along the way yeah, i can cook a steak too yeah thanks outback so you work there too yeah oh wow that was a no mom and pop organizations for you. No, not really. <laughs> I just went in Bowling Green. I just went. And I was like, "What restaurant makes the most money? The Steakhouse." Yeah. And then I just went there. So you can cook a steak. Yeah, I can cook a steak pretty good. Yeah. I was a server, but I learned how that. That's what I wanted to learn how to do. Cook so, a steak. Yeah, and that's what I learned how to so do. So you can pack shit. You can cook a steak. And you know that uh, you know if you're dating a bipolar person, they should tell you. Yes. Up front, you can throw a ball or two. A few different types. Yeah. I can hit them. Yeah. Yeah. You can write a speech. Yeah. Yeah. Somewhat. (laughs) You you know how much you can and can't drink, kind of? None. Yes. (laughs) I can drink none. That's, that's, it took me about a decade to learn that, that I should drink none. How many arrests? Three or four? Uh Uh-huh. Uh, two, I would say, were my fault. Uh, Oh, really? Yeah. One, I don't want to, it's... Still pending? No, it's not pending. Uh-huh. It's just, uh, it's it was terrible. Uh, yeah, yeah. It was the it was the end. Oh of yeah, the marriage. So oh oh yeah. I don't want to. Oh really? We're not. Yeah talking? we're yeah we're uh, me and her at a really good place now. <laughs> so me bringing up stuff like that not going to help anything. Nothing. Yeah, it, it can only do damage at this point. Uh huh. So everything's cool. Everything's pretty cool. As yeah. cool as it, I think it's ever going to be. She's back in, uh, where is she? She moved, She lives here now. Oh, so that's why your folks are out, because of the kid? Yeah. And then the, I think they were just interested in Los Angeles. They and they never been here? Mm-mm. Really? Mm-mm. Where'd you take them? Uh, my dad took my mom to Venice Beach, because he'd been here once before with me, and I took him to Venice, and he... You like it? It's perfect for, you so know... You watch people and... Yeah, and then you're like, this is L.A., they yeah, really got yeah. people crazy. I'm yeah. like, it kind of, it yeah, is yeah, a yeah. good dichotomy of L.A., I guess. Well, it's, the only, it's one of the few places in L.A. where there are people. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah like, yeah, walking around. Well, and then I took them through where ch- the Chinese theater was. Sure. And I was going to stop. On Hollywood Boulevard. Yeah. And so my, you took them to Hollywood Boulevard and Venice Beach. And my mom was like, this is like a mall, I don't care. And I was like, that's okay. It, it is now. And then I, I was like, Dad, I can take you to the Hollywood sign. He was like, no, I saw it from the interstate, I'm good. I was like, I guess that is. And then they're done. That's pretty much. I mean, get I took, some Mexican food. Yeah. Okay. Across the street from our place. Uh-huh. Yeah, that was about it. I mean, they're so great. My parents, they just want to help out, and they're not like hipsters. They don't want to go do, you know, yeah, eat yeah. at a restaurant. That doesn't fascinate just them. Just want to hang out with you and the kid. And yeah, and just. How old's the kid? He's four and a half. All right. So let's get back to it. So you start doing comedy at Zanies, and then you know what? You just stayed in in Nashville. Yeah, um, I just started living on a couch, a f- 
buddy, open micer yeah. buddy, him and his girlfriend. Yeah. Uh, I lived on a couch for eight months and worked at a restaurant in Nashville. And if I wasn't doing stay, if I wasn't on stage, I was at Zany's just sitting in the back watching. And that was my whole life was just figuring out how to do it and just drinking when we weren't doing that, trying out drugs, uh-huh. listening to comedy and comedy and comedy. That's you it. Know. That's a, that's the life right there. Yeah. It, no other world. Not going to write. Not going to do sketches. No. Sit in the back of Zany's. Gonna drink for you know, probably half for free. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, and watch dudes do this, and then go out after, and then talk about comedy more. Yeah, and then yeah. drink, and then bug like Jake Johansson and people they yeah. want to hang out and be like, well, how did you? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then Jake be like, hey, just ease up. <laughs> did he? Yeah, <laughs> I wasn't offended. I mean, I probably was a little bit like, oh my god, I was scared. And then like probably a couple of years later, I was like, he was really nice about that. Yeah. yeah, he handled that very nice. It was probably <laughs> awful what I was because I was drunk and very aggressive and passionate. Yeah, how long did it take you to get up to headlining? Probably uh, five or six years. Yeah, because when did I work with you? You were featuring for me. Yeah, yeah, yeah that was. Uh, yeah, you're one of them strong features. You're well, that's it. Took seven and a half seven and a half years to get feature work at Zany's. Uh huh. Like but I was you're already right. headlining. Like yeah, B rooms and the, stuff. Right, right, right. And that's then, a, that's the funny thing. It's like people are like, I was headlining B rooms. I'm like, yeah, you're what they could afford. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'll headline for the same amount I featured for. Well, that's well, and I was making a little more, but like that's the thing. Like they just saw me forever. Yeah, as that goofy MC that came in. Well, that well, that's the problem with like everybody has with their home clubs. Yeah, it's like they won't fucking headline you unless you know you go away. That's why I had to move to Seattle for six years. That's where you went? Yeah. How how many years into comedy were you? I was about three and a half in. And you went to Seattle? Well, I was, uh, I'd was. i worked on the road with Ralphie May a little bit. And yeah, you were in this garage once before, sitting over there. Uh, yeah. Smoking. That's where you saw him, Ralphie in Seattle? No, he came through Nashville. I was, I'd was i worked my way up to being the house MC, pretty much. I got to work with like Hedberg yeah. three weeks before it, he died. Oh, God, what was that like, dude? Uh, at the time, it was the most amazing thing in the world to me. Because when I was still in college, I found him on Napster before yeah. he was famous. Yeah. And I, he was my little secret. Yeah. And I was a comedy nerd. No yeah. one else really gave a shit. Yeah. And then he got huge. And I remember telling him, I was like, when you got popular, it pissed me off because you were my secret. Yeah. And he was like, yeah, Napster, right? I was like, yeah. Uh, did a bunch of drugs the first night. Um, second night, I was just exhausted. It was all overwhelming to me. Yeah. Uh, and it was a little calmer and I went to leave and Mitch looked up. He's like, Hey man, will you go get me some drink? I was like, yeah. And he was like, and get yourself something. I want to hang out with you tonight. And yeah. we went and did blow at this closed bar in printer's alley uh-huh. all night. Yeah. And did he talk much? Yeah. He and I talked the whole night and then Lynn was there too. Yeah. And that yeah. was, it was another two guys that were with us were like local guys that were really drunk. Uh huh. But he, he he always seemed like he he needed to lock in and have some company. Yeah, that was very much. Yeah, and I, you know, I don't like. I was never a guy that did cocaine. Yeah, like I've probably done a handful of times. Only one time without drinking. Yeah, every time I did it was so we could drink more. More exactly. Like and people are like, I'm just going to do coke. I'm like, why would you do that? Yeah, like, that don't... seems crazy. Yeah, yeah, I was the same way. It's so. like going to a pot dealer and be like, I need some pot, and I got coke. I'm like that is the exact opposite of what I want. Right. Well, yeah, no, it was always for me it had to go together. Yeah. To get that balance. Yeah, no, I could never just do it. Just like, do I'd coke? still be running somewhere. Yeah. So you were just doing coke, no drinking? With- no, I, we were oh, drinking. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and, and this was three weeks before he died? Yeah. It was It was over. I mean, it was also a lesson because I, to this day, I've never seen anybody use the quantity and different types of drugs he was using. Yeah. It's just booze, tons of just straight vodka, basically. Yeah. Just he had a bag, what he called Skittles. It was just pills. Yeah. He just pulled those out, and then yeah. he'd find blow afterwards. Right. So he wasn't uh, doing the H with you. I think that was something he got. He kept private. Yeah. 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 No, I had a couple of friends that yeah that they're like, did he mention this to you? And I was like, nope. No. Yeah, I think that was uh, that was the one that was where he drew the line. That's something he didn't have very specific type of friends for that type of behavior. I would. I would hope so. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, it's sad, man. It's sad, and you know, because I knew he looked a little beat up by that time. I think too, didn't? Yeah, he? I remember when he walked in the green room there in Zany's. Yeah, and just how jaunt. Yeah, yeah. he looked. Yeah, and yeah. then almost 
like he looked like he had jaundice too. He was yeah. like yeah, like yeah. greenish yellow. Yeah, yeah, he had a weird pallor, pallor to his skin and his yeah, things. yeah. It's like hollow. Yeah, yeah. It was, it was, it was it not was, the guy that I pictured. No, it was sad man, and he had, wore those glasses and he couldn't quite see his. And eyes. then the shows were he was a couple shows I had to pull him off stage. Like, like he would just be laying on stage and telling me to come get him, and then I'd, like he was in. Did this, he do well? That, yeah, that was the saddest part that I realized later. Yeah. Because at the time I didn't realize. I just thought it was, this is so amazing and cool. Like, that's a nightmare, that the more fucked up you are, the more they like you. Yeah. <laughs> You're fucked. Yeah. Yeah, you can't get out of it. You're fucked. Yeah, they expect it. Yeah, no one's going to be like, hey, stop. Yeah. Because everyone around you is making a ton yeah, of money. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's when I realized how clubs work, too. Like, oh, this dude's... Oh, okay. If you're making them money, they don't care. Yeah, they want to make sure you got what you need. It helped me realize that. I was like, oh, then I don't have to be here. So I need to behave myself. Right. But, like Mitch told me, too, I remember one, that one of those nights, he was like, make a list. Make a list of all the people that fuck you. And then when you get famous, he was like, there's several clubs I go back to just to fuck with them. Really? Yeah, and I was like, hmm. He's like, I make all their money, yeah. and then I make these dickheads run errands for me the whole time. <laughs> he had a plan, huh? And I was like, okay. Well, he was a real uh Little road dream. guy. Yeah. yeah. So, so that was an important lesson to learn, and you learned that before you went to Seattle? Yeah. Yeah, I knew, well, I met my ex-wife in West Palm Beach, Florida, uh, on the road, and we'd been dating a couple months. It was a lot of fun. I was in over my head. She was 31. I was 25. Mm -hmm. She was a DJ, Puerto Rican, living the dream, I thought. Yeah. And then she was like, hey, I got a job in Seattle. Would you want to move with me? And I'd never been west of Texas. And I was like, yep. Because I just knew the scene there, too. There was a scene there. And I had this... Um, I was starting to realize that I wasn't going to be allowed to be the comic I wanted to be just doing the South. Yeah. Because with my voice and then my name. Did you ever work with bees? Yeah, he was one of the, he was the first. I quit my uh, serving job to work with killer yeah, bees. Yeah, it was the last minute. Like we need a MC for the week, and I was there. Can you be here tonight? And I was like, Yep. I called the guy, and he was like, um, I was like, I can't fall, find anybody to come in. And he was like, Well, if you don't come in, you're fired. And I was like, Yeah, yeah, that's what I'm saying. Is like I'm not coming in <laughs> anymore. Anymore. <laughs> He's like, well, I'm going to have to fire you. I was like, yeah, yeah, whatever you want to call it. I'm not coming. I'm done. I can leave you tickets for the show, I think, if you want to come that, if you want to hang out. So when you work with Killer Bees, did he pack it out? Mm-hmm. So, like, that was, uh, so you're emceeing this this regional dude who's huge. Huge. Huge, and, and that's your intro into the life. Of, yes. Of you, that was the night you committed. That was it. That was uh, my first gig. It was, uh... And the the second week was Bruce Bruce. So, Interesting. So I went both from, ends of the spectrum. Yes, in two weeks. Uh huh. They, they uh they called me last minute again. And, so you're dealing with all white, and then all black, but huh. like like different type of white, like mm -hmm. not your audience all white. No, I know Southern all white. The yes, old school. Yes. Yeah. And the, they don't speak the King's English either. Uh huh. Kind of thing. Like a lot of bees act I didn't understand. Really? A lot of it I did not. I don't get what he's talking about sometimes. Save up. Yeah, Save I up. still That's don't it. know. But Bees Save gave me up. great advice too about drinking. Save up. That's he said it. don't drink before the show. He's like, because you'll get a, a little you'll find that perfect buzz one time and then you'll spend twenty years chasing it. And he's like, drink afterwards. And that helped me. Was he was he uh straightened out yet? No, no, and I, that was good advice coming from someone like that at that time because he was all over the place. That one night you hit the perfect buzz, you're going to spend the rest of your life tra chasing it, trying to get it's, that on. It's not about the comedy. Mm -mm. It's about like there's that one night where that combination, yes, between comedy and booze is perfect. Perfect. It's perfect, <laughs> and you'll be chasing that for twenty years. And there's something to that. No, no doubt. Because our heads are all fucked up, and you're like, oh, the okay, like I'm wearing underwear that I'm very comfortable That's talking right. in. You know what I mean? It's superstitious. Yeah. Uh, the second week was Bruce Bruce. I remember walking in with my bag, and the staff was getting ready, and they all stopped. I was always so nervous, because I was like, I've never really done a black room, yeah. let alone sold out. Right. And uh, 
so nervous. And the whole staff, they're like doing their, and they all just stop and just look at me all at once. The whole place gets quiet. Yeah. And one girl goes, are you the MC? And I was like, yeah. And then they all just fell out. And I was like, this is, this is the end. At Zany's. Yeah. I was like, this is the end. Yeah. It lasted a week. Uh huh. I was a comedian for a week. How'd that go? Really good. Um, Bruce Bruce said, just don't be afraid. And I was like, okay. And I was, the first minute I was afraid and they did not. And then someone said something and it pissed me off. Yeah. And, you, and after that, I was <clears> fine. You, 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 you held your ground. Yeah. I, I said something right back because it was that instinct. Yeah, again. yeah. I was just like, fuck you. And yeah. when I did like, fuck you or something like that, yeah. they were all on my side. It was the confidence thing. And I was like, okay, thank God. That's actually a fairly amazing moment to do well in front of a black crowd. Mm. I mean, there, I felt invincible for a while, like way too cocky. Yeah, because it really is about that. Because the lesson, like what he said, is exactly it. Don't be afraid. Just be yourself. Yeah. And and if you have any insecurity at all that that shows, they're gonna see it. Yeah. And they're gonna be like, no, God, he doesn't have his shit together. Yeah. That's yeah. <laughs> yes. We paid for his show. Yeah. What is this? <laughs> yeah. But then I found out, you know. Bruce Bruce likes a white MC to go up there. He does. Yeah, that's that's his thing. It right? is, so yeah. he asked for it. Yes. Oh, yes. uh, look at that. Yeah. They told me that after that week. I just thought, oh, they've got confidence in me. Like, no, I was the only white guy available. Uh-huh. Yeah. So uh, I met her. We moved to Seattle because I knew Mitch had been up there. I knew about you. Yeah, and I knew the politics would be all right. Yeah. You know, would lean towards my side. You could get in. Yeah. Because you had chops and, you know, it was a small enough scene that you know, you could go in as a middle and you were already strong. And yeah, yeah. Yeah. I did that in San Francisco where you didn't have to go through all the ranks. No, I just you had an act. Yeah. I just had to do a couple of mics and right. not introduce myself till I got on stage. And then they're like, oh, who's this guy? Right. And then after that, it was. Yeah. So you were up there for six years. Yeah. I, I, my plan was three, three yeah. to four. Yeah. Um, married. We got married real quick. Uh-huh. We got known her eight months. We got married in Vegas real quick. <sighs> man, I was just having a good time. Sure, man. Uh, yeah, sounds fun. Uh, then it went south pretty quick. After the kid? Uh, yeah. I mean, before the kid, it was not good. The kid was, he wasn't planned uh-huh. on my part. Uh-huh. Um, I wasn't upset about it. I've always wanted to be a dad. So, uh-huh. you know, I was like, oh, we're going to make this work. And then it was like, no. Nope. Uh-huh. And then that got ugly, you know, the divorce and stuff. That got pretty ugly. Mm. So I was kind of stuck in Seattle for a couple of years. Is that where you got the arrested? Yeah. Uh-huh. Uh, one arrest before. Before her? Before the pregnancy. Uh-huh. No. No, all my arrests came when I was with her. All my trouble with the law. I don't know if that's a coincidence, but. <laughs> was it was it drinking-related trouble? Oh, yeah. I was saying that the other night. I was like, oh, you know, uh. I've never been arrested when booze wasn't involved. Yeah. <laughs> so, it was like I went through a roadblock here like two weeks ago. Yeah. And my first thought was like, oh, oh fuck. fuck. Oh, wait. Yeah. Hey, I'm okay. Yeah. Okay, this is great. How you doing, officer? Yeah, just look him right in the eye. Yeah. What's up? Yeah, what's going on? Yeah. I literally have nothing to hide. This is fantastic. It's an exciting moment. Yes. Sir. To pull up to a roadblock and go like, everything all right? I'm good, yeah. yeah. Are you okay? And they're looking at your eyes. Go ahead, look in. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I'm She's clear. shit-faced. I'm yeah. good. Yeah. I am, I am clear, man. <laughs> well, I did that. Uh, it was like two months after I was sober. I was hanging out with some buddies of mine that were in a band. Stayed and watched them all night. They drank the whole show. And I was like two months after I was sober. So we get in the car and we're driving. We go through like a late night place to get something to eat and we're in there and that's when i realized my buddy who in my head i was like well he's the least drunk he should drive yeah and then he's ordering food and i realized how drunk he was and i was like maybe wait a minute i can try hey i'm sober let me drive and he's like yeah what i was like it's all new to me i'm sorry i thought we were being very smart about this <laughs> but when i worked with you had you just were you sober or had you know, had you just gotten sober how how long how long, how long you got uh, when we worked together, we I was sober. Yeah, right. Um, the first time we met, I was not here. Yeah, with, well, uh, yeah, with Ralphie. No, I was not. Yeah. And then that time in San Francisco was definitely <laughs> not so. That's the first time I did Molly. I think the only time I've done Molly. Yeah, you weren't just drunk. Either. No, I was. I was already drunk. And then yeah. this girl's like, "Do you want some of this?" And it was like white powder. And I was like, "I don't want to be up." Yeah. In San Francisco on coke. Yeah. I was like, "I'll get arrested." Yeah. 
And she was like, no, it's 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 called Molly. You just put it on your tongue. And I was like, all right, fuck it. Yeah. And it, it's just MDMA, I guess. Uh-huh. I'd never done like that. Like ecstasy? Yeah. Kind of, yeah. And I guess when we, about the time I started talking to you, like, it's it, starting to it kick in. kicked in. I was like, this is fun. <laughs> And then you kept asking me leading questions. I was like, I need to stop talking, <laughs> but I feel so good about everything. Like, how could any of this bite me in the ass? Yeah. No, you didn't let on. You, you were like, I just want you to know this and uh, about what you know that thing. And I'm like, All right, what do you mean? You're like, I don't know. I can't. I'm, yeah. I'm not do it. <laughs> I like you. Yeah. <laughs> know that. <laughs> oh well. So all right. So after now. I imagine that the the sobriety was you know primarily to to at least support a a a, a reasonable relationship with your ex and and the kid and yeah and the new relationship whatever that is are you married again or no 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 no, no. um I did find a wonderful uh, girl mm-hmm. that I realized like because for two years after my divorce I just kind of lived on the road I didn't have a place. Slept on a bunch of couches in a hotel. And all your money was funneling back? Yeah, like no money. Yeah, yeah. it was all going. As kids. soon as I got money, it was. Yeah, yeah. and then sometimes I don't even the kid because I didn't have any. Yeah. You know, it was like lawyers and yeah. fees and all that it's stuff. Stupid. It's just a nightmare. And uh, I was quite a mess. It was fun. It was a lot of fun. But uh, I remember I met her and she had a boyfriend. And I just remember like, and then I, I, I ran into her in New York. I went and saw her. And her boyfriend was so you there. left Seattle and went where? Just on the road. Then I met this girl, uh, my girlfriend now, at a comedy festival. She had a boyfriend um, who was six years younger than her. And I just, I remember thinking, like, I really like her. Yeah. Um, And I, I remember sitting her down like this in, like, uh, Cobble Hill in Brooklyn and yeah. being like, hey, when this is done yeah. and this runs its course, give me a call. Right. Because I like you. Yeah. And she was like, what are you talking about when this is done? I was like, this will be done. Yeah. <laughs> You're six years older. Believe me. And then she was like, well, what about you? And I was like, yeah, my wife is six years, my ex-wife is six years older than me. Yeah. There's a, it's so gonna, You're planting the seeds. Yeah. You're like, I'm going to have She to- loved it. She's like, it's such a strong move. And I was like, it's really not, because if it doesn't work out, who gives a shit? It's yeah. just a line I said, if it does, I'm pretty awesome. Yeah. So we text every now and then just to say, hey. Uh, one day, the text started getting like, heated. It was just like more. Yeah. Like there was a more of a conversation, not just like, hey, where are you? Yeah. yeah. What's up? Yeah. Uh, and I was like, something's happening. And then she uh, she called my bluff. I was like, hey, why don't you come work with me in Nashville next week? I did a couple of headlining dates. She's Zany. a comic? Yeah. And uh, she was like, okay. And I was like, oh, oh okay. Well, I'm going to make some phone calls. I did not. I just thought that would be a nice fucking yeah. thing to say. Yeah. And she came and we got along really well. And then it just kind of went from there. And then she's a drinker. Uh huh. She's a lot better at it than I am. Uh huh. And so there's like a couple months where I would just go a little crazy. And then there was just one night the next day she was like, Hey, if you want to keep doing this, you can't do that anymore. What was that? Just be a mess. Yeah. I would just get sloppy. I wasn't violent or anything when I was drinking. It was never violent. I was just sloppy yeah. and embarrassing more than anything. Because it was a race. I learned to drink in the South. It's, mm-hmm. it's a fucking race. Yeah. It's like, oh, we're going to have two beers? Why would we do that? Why would we just have two beers? <laughs> I still don't understand. Like, so I don't she's drink. a controlled drinker. Yes. She's right. very good at it and yeah. very good at being drunk. Yeah. To me, it was like, okay, we're this drunk. Let's get yeah. more drunk. Let's get lost. Yeah. Let's yeah. go on an adventure. Why yeah. would we just sit here and talk to these same people? Yeah. That guy has a weird haircut i need to go say things to him yeah um and i was like okay i was like i'll just quit drinking she was like okay and i just did so when you now when you work i mean how long did you open for ralphie on and off for about five or six years so he was a he's a big uh oh yeah there's he kept me afloat a lot and taught me how to do the road and like what did you learn from ralphie just how to work i mean he works yeah you know it's it's not it's not necessarily what i want to end up doing the way he does it right because it's you know 50 weeks a year yeah and he's on the road the whole time doing radio and you know he hustles it's interesting when you meet that guy they're up in the morning on the phone yeah doing the phone for next week yeah doing the phoners yeah yeah it's almost like oh okay 
and then just to keep that and then to keep building it because you know you start seeing guys that'll have it for a while and then yeah. they're gone yeah and then just to keep and then he works a room really well yeah he's a he's a monster and then I've to this day I've never seen any comic besides maybe Caliendo that's better at radio uh-huh it's he takes over the show, yeah. Which I can't, I still can't do, and I don't have a desire to do either. I yeah. think it's part of my problem, but yeah. it does work, yeah. And he said that he he swears by radio is what is more responsible for his fame than anything else. And yeah, I'm success. sure that I'm sure that's true. Regional radio. I mean, he he he's taught me how to structure like long form sets and things like that. Now he's a little more verbose than I am, yeah, but. As but far you, as an arc and everything. Well, like no, that. it's important to like you know to to see somebody who 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 does it and nails it and he's a pro about it and you know really puts on a show. It's a it's a, it like because they're part you like me. You know, you kind of get in. It's like I can pretty much do what I want. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'm gonna take it easy. I'm yeah, that's sit, that was my pro. Yeah, I'm I was gonna like, sit around and write some shit down today. <laughs> maybe get to it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah maybe get to it. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Yes, if there's not some on NPR I heard that I want to go read about. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. But yeah, when you meet those dudes who are like, I gotta, like, you know, now I gotta write a new hour, but I don't, I only can write by doing, going up on stage. That's, that's, and he made me feel better about that because I was always. He does that too, right? Yeah. Yeah. Cause I was, I have friends that would just sit and write. write jokes, yeah. I and I was like, I can't do that. Yeah. Cause when I do it, it sounds like I'm telling a joke. Right. I'm exactly. not being I'm a comic. Way. I'm the same way. I yeah. need to just form it in my head and I'll know how I can say that's it. That's right. That made me feel, because for a while I was like, well, maybe I'm not doing any work, but I'm, my act is better than these well, guys. We, the weird thing is about in determining how much work you do is like, you know, we, we dedicate our life to it. Yeah. We live the life. Yes. We get on stage. <laughs> yes. And, you know, we're building shit out. You know, how we do it is our business. Yeah. That's... You know? But I mean, the, the whole sort of working the other stuff, which I didn't really know how to do, which is like making the connections, making, you know, making sure that you're not a dick at the club. Yeah. Uh, you know, make, do the radio, show up for the radio, shutting your mouth, kill the, on the radio. When this dude is talking, that was a big thing for me. Like, okay, this guy's an asshole, yeah. but he's going to give you a couple of weeks of work a year yeah. that you'll need to yeah. tie stuff together. Yeah. And there's several dudes across the country that have been like, nope, fuck yeah. this guy. Yeah, he oh, needs yeah. to know I, how I feel about him. I, I don't, you know, I'm not that vengeful and I don't necessarily have a list, but I certainly know, and you know, I'm not like a, you know, I don't sell thousands of tickets either, but I, I do know the people that didn't help me. Mm hmm. Yeah, you know, more than anything else. Or fuck me. Yeah. There's a couple people that I won't go out of my way, but if I do become that draw, yeah. That when they, if they ever approach me, I will enjoy saying no to them. Well, yeah, well, I had one thing like that where, you know, I couldn't work at a club for a long time for some, I don't even know the reason why the guy, you know, had it out for me. But, you know, he, you know, and it's a great club. And uh, I just had to accept that it wasn't going to happen for me anymore. And I, and I liked the club. And I didn't work there for over a decade. And he apologized to me, you know, in Montreal. You know, he came up to me and it's like, look, man, I, I, I'm sorry. Uh, you know, you're a great act. I want to have you back. I, uh, and he literally very graciously yeah. apologized for icing me for so long. And I went back and I sold out five shows and I killed and I loved working there and it was great. Well, that's sometimes it's beyond your control. Sometimes a waitress likes you and the owner likes that waitress. Yeah, I, it, it usually comes down to a waitress problem. You're yeah. Right. <laughs> it's, it's definitely about pussy, I would say 80% of pussy the time. Pussy and money, man. That's it. Even in this business, yeah. It's, That's all, in everything. Yeah. It's, it's pussy and money. It's like, that girl wants to fuck me. You're like, yeah. yeah. That's terrible. Yeah. Because I know I should be excited. Yeah. But he wants to fuck her, so yeah. now I can't come back to because Des Because she talked to you, you yeah. you're not allowed in the state anymore. Yes. Yeah, I can't do comedy in <laughs> Chicago. <laughs> all right, man. Well, I, I think we did it. Yeah. You? Yeah, I guess so. This is fun. Thanks for talking. Thanks for having me. That's it. That's our show, folks. Thank you for listening. Go to WTFPod.com. Pick up the app if you're new to the show. You can always get the most recent 50, that's six months worth, for free uh, on iTunes or on my site. Or, or you can get the app. Enjoy. Get some JustCoffee.coop. Leave a comment. Do what you got to do. I appreciate it. I'm full of panic. It's been an aggravating day. I don't like the idea that there's some guy out there as me, spending money that isn't his, 
based on my credit. Fucking monster. The fuck is wrong with people? Career criminals, man. They're always one step ahead. They're always figuring out the angles, but I guess it's a problem a lot of people have. But why me? Why? It wasn't about you. Don't make it about you. You were not targeted. I don't think. Huh. Maybe. Maybe this guy's like, I deserve Mark Maron's credit. Him and I are a lot alike. He stole my essence. I don't know. Fuck. Boomer lives!